In this episode, Shakespearean actress turned improviser Claire Malky and I came up with three sketches. What would improv back in Shakespearean time, what would it have looked like? Yes, and if. Two Karens maybe having a conversation on the cycling bikes about current events and or, you know, something along those lines. Like having trying to have a political conversation but not knowing what they're talking about. That would be great. You know, you brought up Neo from The Matrix. What if you woke up and it was right now, today, here, in this life, in this world, what would you decide to do? Which one did we pick? You'll find out on this episode of... It's a Sketch Comedy Podcast Show. Welcome to Sketch Comedy Podcast Show, the one-of-a-kind show where I, Stuart Rice, invite interesting people to have intriguing conversations and then improvise a comedy sketch based on what was talked about. This episode's guest is Claire Malky, and I've got a couple questions for you. Have you ever just picked up and moved to a big metropolitan city you've never visited before, just on a whim? Or how about deciding one day that you need to thrust your fellow generation into informed political discourse? My guess is you probably haven't done either of those things. Claire Malky has. Claire grew up in Virginia and studied classical acting at Hofstra University. After graduating, someone suggested moving to Chicago and, without skipping a beat, she jumped at the opportunity. Arriving in Chicago ready to tackle the stage, she soon realized that the opportunities were actually pretty limited for a Shakespearean actress, but there were tons of opportunities to do improv. So she headed to improv school and started learning and performing at Comedy Court and has worked at a number of festivals. Overhearing a conversation from a peer that included, I don't really understand politics, so I don't really want to get involved, Claire realized that she could help change that attitude, which was important to her because she realized she had the same attitude. To remedy that disinterest, Claire now co-writes and hosts a podcast, Sit Still, Look Opinionated, which is not just informative and non-biased, but it is also downright funny as she and her co-writer come up with fantastic jokes about the headlines that deserve to be on late night talk shows. I highly recommend checking it out, whether you are in the know or trying to be or don't care because you should, and this show can help you get there. And now, my conversation with Claire Malky, risk taker and political motivator for the meh crowd. Hey, I've got a question for you. Yeah. What makes you interesting? You know, I was thinking a lot about this question. Because um, you actually listen to the show. Not everybody does that, by the way, but that was pretty good. I'm, I'm glad I did. And something that came to mind is that I am all about taking a risk and not quite understanding where the reward would come out of it. Um, I think some people like to call that um, being naive, but I like to think of it as being adventurous. Um, so I currently live in Chicago and I moved here straight out of school. I was going to um, move to Manhattan as like the rest of my theater class did. And then one of my friends was like, hey, I'm going to move to Chicago. And I was like, oh, I've never been to that city before. So why don't I just move there? Um, I knew like nothing about the city. I didn't even pick out the apartment that I lived in. Um, but it ended up being the best decision I've ever could have made. Um, uh, how many... So how many years ago did you do that? Um, it'll, be, it'll be three in October. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Chicago. And, and that theme has sort of been very central in my life. Um, in that same vein, I started uh, taking classes at all of the great comedy theaters in Chicago. So I was like, oh, I'm a classically trained Shakespeare actor. Why don't I take some improv classes? And I was like, oh, this is great. I love this. And then... Um, I was looking for more ways I could be creative and I was like, oh, why don't I start a podcast without really doing any research into what all of that entails? Um, but luckily everything has worked out okay for me so far. So I just keep liking to, you know, jump off the cliff and um, land on my feet where it can. Well, that's pretty great. So now, um, so as far as like improv places, Second City, is that one of them? And mm -hmm. um 
Uh, that's cool. Uh, it, one of my favorite podcasts actually comes from Chicago, and it's uh, the Improvised Star Trek. I don't know if you've heard about that. I haven't. I'll have to give that a look. Yeah, though. it's pretty great. Th- those guys are fantastic. They won't be on the show, but um, anyway. Uh, but you are, so that's the best part. Um, so you were a Shakespearean actor, mm-hmm. and you just decided, like, ah, I should probably just throw some improv in there, see what happens. Yeah, so when I decided to move to Chicago, my friend had kind of pitched this city to me as, you know, it's the best of everything. It has a lot of um, film and TV work. It has great regional theater. Um, You know, we are classically trained actors who also uh, had focuses on finding new work, um, which was a little bit interesting that our university pitched it to us as like, oh, you guys have the bones of, you know, the best the best through history, but we're not really going to teach you about contemporary theater, which was a little bit of a, a shell shock when we first got there. So I was like, oh, yes, I can do these sonnets and I can do all of these, like have all of these um, illusions that I, you know, can pinpoint and, you know, know the ins and outs of RNJ and Midsummer and all of those things. Um, but when I moved to Chicago, I realized I was like, oh, this city actually has a lot of comedy and um, sketch comedy and improvisation. And I was like, well, if I'm going to live in this city, I should probably, you know, figure out what it's all about. Um, And I actually used to work on the night staff at the Second City. So I would bus tables, see guests, um, you know, watch for illegal cell phone use. And so I got to take classes for free. So that was something that like, really drove home i was like why why would i not take classes if they're being handed to me right Um, yeah that's that would be silly so it sounds like you went to school learned how to work on horse-drawn carriages got (laughs) out to the world and realized oh everybody's driving a car yeah yeah that's very true um to the way my background was but it really has helped me because I understand language in a way that I think a lot of um, uh, other performers who maybe have different skill sets, like they might be stronger writers or, um, you know, have other skills. But I feel like I can really understand where language is coming from and the the meaning behind every word, even if the writer of the sketch was like, oh, I just thought it was funny. I'm like, oh, I know, I I understand in my bones, like, how to make this sound with, you know, my objective and my obstacle and using those acting techniques in sketch comedy. Um, And I honestly think that's helped me a lot um, in the shows I've worked on. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Have you been in a situation where you like, can you think of a situation where you were in that moment and you were like, oh, I got to, I got to pull something out of like, Oh, yeah. I was doing um, an improv show. There's this um, group that I've worked with in Chicago called Huggable Riot, and they're a sketch comedy group. And I was in a show of theirs last summer in 2019. And then um, in the fall, they were doing sort of a um, just like a one off improv show with a lot of different people who had been in their shows. And um, this one guy, he he also knew Shakespeare and he was kind of like poking at me to see like what I could actually do. And so we like recited some verse back and forth to each other and we had never improvised together before. Um, and so it was so funny to watch us both be like, oh, you you know Shakespeare? You know Shakespeare too? What? Um, so it's definitely been, there have been some moments where I like have to show my chops um, a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. Cool. Have you been in a situation doing improv where you were just like, you were like, I am so lost. You're in a scene and you're just like completely lost. And I, what was that like? Because it's not like that with Shakespearean. You, you you know the marks. You know where you're supposed to be. Exactly. What was, what was it like? <laughs> Give us that one. Um, yeah, because like as you were saying, when you're working with text that is established, like the period is there for a reason. Like the semicolon has a meaning. Um, whereas it, when you're improvising, you have to go with the flow and think on your feet. Um, and when I was first starting out, I was doing some uh, auditions. Obviously, we all do auditions. They come and go. And I was improvising with um, someone who I had worked on or someone who I had worked with on um, some children's shows. And so I knew them quite well, but they were a 
much better improviser than I was. And they were just like calling the shots and they were like, knew what to do took complete command of the stage. And I was in such awe of this person that I sort of forgot what I was doing and how I had to help tell the story. And I definitely floundered on that. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm working with this person that I really admire. Um, And then, I mean, I ended up not booking the show, but like, that's not a big deal. (laughs) Whatever you get it. It's all practice, right? Like Mm -hmm. that's good. That's actually a really good practice is to kind of, and I have been in that situation where you're like with somebody and you're like, whoa, that's (laughs) They're really good. <laughs> you're yeah. just like in awe. You're like, oh, wait, I'm not in the audience. I should probably do something. Mm-hmm. And, and one of my faults, too, is I love to laugh and I constantly laugh all the time. And um, so when I'm in a scene and something's funny, I just I can't help but enjoy it. If my scene partner does a funny accent or comes out as, you know, an inanimate object, like sometimes I'm just going to laugh. But sure. That's- point <laughs> yeah that is actually it, it can be it can be charming and it can also be irritating but most of the time i find it charming um you know unless it's forced mm-hmm. <laughs> if someone's like oh that was really funny oh <laughs> it's like okay well yeah and then if you're, like, if you're not actually gonna laugh at it like don't laugh at it <laughs> yeah exactly exactly mm-hmm. um have you been in that situation where you work with um with someone who like chewed up the scene a little too much and uh and like you're you're starting to feel uncomfortable because they're they're taking too long to get to their point. <laughs> yeah, there's um so some of the improv classes that I've taken, um, they're open to all people, uh, which I think is great because you know everyone should try performing, and I think it brings a lot to your everyday life. Um, but as someone Plus who it gains, you gain an appreciation for when people do perform. I feel like that that definitely worked for me was I, I used to be like, well, that wasn't that funny. But then when you're up there and you're doing it like, oh, man, it's hard. Like, that's amazing. That was funny. Right. Like, I, sorry. That's such a good point, because I feel like a lot of people um, only see the outcome of the arts and don't see all of the like labor and intensiveness that goes into it. So when you're actually trying to make it when you're trying to um, establish a scene and make it coherent and also be funny. Um, I think, yeah, that's so true that sometimes people are like, oh, I can do that. But it's like, can you, can you do that? Yeah. Um, oh, it's like anytime anybody says I should be a stand-up comedian and it's like, really? Well, d- tell me some jokes. It's like, oh no, I'll just tell stories about my life and, and they're funny. And I'm like, yeah, I've known you for 10 years. I've never laughed at anything you said. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a good point because I'm like, you know, like stand ups, they like they're it's, they have a, a story, like they know what they're saying. They're not up there just being like, oh yeah, that one time at Thanksgiving, my aunt got really mad, and you're like, okay, but like, what's the point? And right. I totally agree with that. Um, yeah. I was in, so I was in one of these classes that was for everyone, which is great. Um, and this this guy, it was one of those like warm ups where you know everyone's on the back line. Um, and then, you know, two people at a time go into a scene and he just came out and he just started talking and he was talking and talking and talking and wouldn't let me get a word in edgewise. And I remember being like, OK, so I don't necessarily want to work with you, um, but you kind of just have to roll with it. And like if that person is going to talk a bunch, which is also hard for me, because as I'm sure you've noticed, I also like to talk a lot. What? So- <laughs> So when someone else is like doing all the talking, I'm like, okay, how can, what do I character do in this scene? Like, it's not just Claire up there on the improvised stage. It's whatever character I bring to it. So maybe I know this other character. They always do this. They always talk. So in those moments, I kind of have to go back to my, it's the character work, not my personal stand up moment. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. I think and that's hard. It's hard to do because making that switch from, this is me to this is a character. And then especially in improv when and in that and I've performed in that situation where you're like, this is a whole nother scene. I have to be a completely different character mm-hmm. and having to devise those as you're going along. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's, it's good. It's good stuff. And you, you learn to use that in other parts of your life, too, which is pretty you great. I, I do think people need to go take an improv class just to get an understanding most people don't need to stay in improv because they're not good at it. Um, and I feel that way about podcasting. Like most of the time when I listen to a show, I'm like, oh, cool. You've got you and a couple of your buddies. You're drinking beer and talking about pop culture around sitting around a table. 
neat. Um, also, don't do it anymore, right? That's a recurring theme that happens when anytime I talk to a podcaster. So anytime a podcaster contacts this show and says, I'd like to be on, I'm always like, ooh, we'll see. Your show that you do, Sit Still, Look Opinionated, first off, the title's brilliant. I thought it was great. Um, and I was like, okay, well, I've got to give it a listen. I got to see what this is all about. Brilliant show. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, don't, I don't give praise off very easy when it comes to podcasting. So what was the genesis of this show? First off, tell us what the show is about and why you're doing it. And then let's, let's, let's talk about how you, how you got into that and, and all that. So, yeah, thank you. Um, I really, I really appreciate that. Cause we, my, um, writing partner, Mike, we put a lot of work into the show, so it's, it's good to know that it, uh, is received well. Um, so before COVID-19 and possibly post COVID-19, I worked at a fitness studio, um, that had indoor cycling bikes, um, that uh, had um, a word that has an S, S cycle. Um, I don't want to necessarily <laughs> say, but I'm no idea. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, okay. It's a, it's a fitness studio where a lot of um, affluent women work out. Um, so Karens. All the Karens. All work the Karens out work at there. the okay. studio. Okay. Cool and unfortunately, um, not all, but some of my coworkers could possibly also be described as Karens um, in, in the most loving sense. And I don't mean that they didn't care, but just some of those stereotypes I think existed by the nature of our workplace and the people that we worked with. Um, and uh, our president, number 45, was getting impeached last fall, which I think everyone has just forgotten about. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got bigger things on our plate at this point, I guess. Oh yeah, way bigger things. <laughs> and um, some of my coworkers, we were like, "Oh yeah, I don't even know the difference between the House and the Senate. Like, I don't even know this stuff doesn't affect me. Like, you know, politics. It's just not really my thing." And I was like, "Oh my gosh," because I I'm a news junkie. Like, I listen to, you know, the Daily, NPR, um, you know. Uh, so many, so many news shows. I'm always like trying to take it in and learn from different perspectives. And I figured like, how can I access a, access a way to help people like me, maybe other Karen types, unfortunately, um, to get them to care? Like how, how can I get them to care about what's going on in the world and not necessarily just women, like also young, other young people, um, who maybe it's just like, I have other things on my list. Like I have to, you know, before COVID, be like I have my job, I have my social life, like, you know, that stuff, everyone else just deals with that. Um, I have to manage the 535 Instagram followers that I've got as well as learn about news. What? Mm -hmm. How am I supposed to do this? No, I'm not making light of it actually, but that, that, that's actually not too far from the truth is that we're hit with more things to pay attention to yeah. than previous generations. I am lumping myself into your generation, which is incorrect, but <laughs> let's just play that game. But there are just more things to pay attention to now. And it is, it's, it's, it's hard because it's, uh, we're not as engaged. That isn't the theater it used to be. That used to be entertainment for people and it's not so much anymore. So to your point, there are a lot of people, my generation too, that, that don't, understand things and then because they don't understand them they think like it's that uh you ever seen that chris pratt uh meme where it's like uh i don't know what the ha the difference between the house and the senate and now i'm afraid to ask like oh, i feel like that yeah. one is pretty prevalent yeah. like that's a pretty good one and it's it's so true and a lot of people that that was the part of it it's like uh i don't really know so i'm just not even going to talk about it and i and the thing that really got me i was like politics is for us. Like this is our country. Like you don't have to be a political scientist or have a degree or have, you know, you know, a wealth at your fingertips, understand what's going on around you. Um, and so I figured I was like, you know what, it's time for us to, um, get opinionated and have those conversations and not feel afraid about it. Um, 
And so the, the title is, you know, Sit Still, Look Pretty, which I'm from Virginia and I went to Cotillion and they told us all, you know, girls will sit pretty and guys will sit strong. Um, and I wanted to play on that a little bit. So that's where the title came from. And then when we came to starting the show, you know, that idea where it's like, if you have an idea, you should start talking about it. And like, maybe somehow it'll, it'll happen. Um, so I was taking the, the train, the CTA here in Chicago, and I ran into my friend's boyfriend who he also is a writer and an actor. And he was like, Oh, what's going on? Like, what's up? And I was like, Oh, I have this idea for this comedy show that would be informative. So people could learn in a way that was like easy to understand and was like geared towards them. And he was like, Oh my gosh, that's a great idea. I'd love to write it and produce it with you. And I was like, Oh, okay. Like you, you want to like help me with this idea and we'll do this together and it won't just be me. And he was like, yeah, totally. And he was super on top of um, like meeting every week. And he even like had us write out a contract so that we would stay on top of our writing process. Um, and then we sort of jumped in two feet first and we were been writing every week. Um, and we wrote uh, 18 episodes and a trailer. And now we're working on a season two. Um, and I've learned a lot and definitely podcasting is a lot more than I think what people think it is. And in the same vein of, um, wanting a story to have an arc, I want my podcast to have an arc too. So I want there to be a beginning, middle and end. And like, why does it matter? So why are we listening to this? Cause I think it's really easy for people to just say the facts, be like, you know, George Washington was the first president of the United States, but it's like, okay, but like, why do you need to know that? Or like, why do you need to know about misinformation? Or why do you need to know about the difference between, you know, the democratic and Republican party? Um, so now we're working on season two and we've got some great episodes in store. I'm so excited to share them once we release them in September. It'll sort of be like a, a back to the podcast, back to school type thing. Oh, I like it. I like that mm -hmm. a lot. You release weekly? Yes, we release weekly on Fridays. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, good on you for keeping a nice consistent schedule because I certainly can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but that's good. Uh, uh, so you... Um, you just decided like it was time you heard all I, I you heard people your your age like saying I don't know and it was time to just fill that space I think that's fantastic what when you think about um, where you'd like to see the show go what what is it that you're hoping happens with the show do you have like a, a desire for it to do something beyond just I, you know, I, I, you could have a million listeners, you could have five listeners. I have no idea, but like, what is it that you want to see this, this show do? I think my goal with the show has changed a lot over the course of writing and creating it, especially working with, um, my writing partner, Mike and working with, um, a second person. Cause initially I was selfishly in it just for me. And I was like, Ooh, this will be my way that I'll make a mark and everyone will know my name and it'll be great. And then I realized as I was doing the work, I was like, oh, you know, yes, it's great. I love having people listen to my voice for 45 minutes, but it's really, I, my ultimate goal, even if only 10 people listen to it, is that they've gone and learned something and that they've gone and had a conversation with their grandmother, their neighbor, their friend um, about what's going on in the world. Because if you don't talk about what's happening. That's how complacency forms. And that's how people stop questioning things and just fall in line. Um, so that's totalitarianism one. basically. Is yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I mean, uh, uh, famously, um, uh, oh boy, I can't believe I can't remember in there at brave new world. I don't know if you ever read the book, but, uh, uh by Aldous Huxley, he, uh, him and, uh, in 19, uh, 1984 and brave new world were two books that, we're side by side. One pick pitched it as no information will ever be given to anybody. And that's how, that's how totalitarian, that's 1984. The other one was you're going to have access to all the information, but nobody cares. And he was right. Like that's where we're at. And so I like that you're like, Hey, as long as we get some dialogue going, as we get some discourse going, that's important. And I think that's really good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, tell me about, t tell, well, you don't have to tell me, I listen to the show, but <laughs> tell people, what, how is the format of the show set up? So, because it's interesting. I was, I was actually 
pleasantly surprised by the way the set the, the setup the show was. So go ahead and, and just tell me how tell us how that works. Yeah. Um, so in the trailer that we released when we were first writing the show, I wanted people to understand that um, like you wouldn't go drinking without eating something before you leave. At least people who are cognizant. Um, so the same way the show, this would be your way to understand what you're going into before you went to the polls. Um, so with that in mind, and when you go into a voting situation or even having a conversation, you need to be prepared. You need to have some tools. So there's two parts to it. The show starts with, um, usually a little joke about a margarita and usually something about the, the week that has happened. So when it was Cinco de Mayo, we made jokes about how, you know, that's not Mexican Independence Day, you know, be respectful. Right. Um, and then we go into a deep dive about a topic. So we've done misinformation. We've done education. We did three parts on the healthcare system, um, looking at, um, you know, Trump's plan, Biden's plan. And even though uh, Bernie Sanders was out of the running, we still wanted to look at his uh, plan for healthcare. And then we do uh, weekly headlines in sort of the, um, daily show, a satirical way where it's the, pe- the headline and then a punchline. And then I have an interview, um, to round out the show with, um, before it was sort of with just anyone who had something pertinent to say, but now we're relating it, uh, we're at least attempting to relate it to the topic at hand. Um, so when we did our episode on education, we had, um, a high school teacher come on and talk about the state of education. When we did our episode on healthcare, um, I had a friend of mine who works in um, for a healthcare firm in DC, a lobby firm, and so uh, she came and spoke to us um, very eloquently about you know the state of healthcare in America. Um, and also, I, I try to have people that are accessible, and it's like, oh yeah, like this isn't someone who is like you know the mayor or the president. I mean, which would be amazing, but uh, it's usually tried someone who whose voice people will listen to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll be on your show. No, yeah. no I'm just kidding. Nobody cares about what I say. Um, when you think about, um, I, and it is, it's a, I, what was actually the really surprising thing is the, the headline with the punchline mm-hmm. was actually funny because that, <laughs> that's hard. It is harder to do than people think without rehashing somebody else's joke. You did a fantastic job. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, thank you. Uh, so the other thing is, uh, the, the other thing I'm thinking about is we're in a really interesting time and you're an informed person. When you look out and see all the things that are happening right now with between COVID, Black Lives Matter, um, and really even before that, I mean, we, we still talk about it, right? The, uh, the, um, uh, why can't I not? Think of the the hashtag Me Too movement. Oh, yes. mm-hmm. Yeah, all, I mean, there's a lot of different things happening right now. What is the thing that gets you the most? Um, that gets you the most either excited or uh, the opposite of excited. <laughs> like, like, what is the thing that you go? We need to make this real change. What is that? Mm-hmm. I I think a lot about. Um, Okay, this is going to be maybe out of left field, but, you know, The Matrix. In that movie, you know, Neo understands there's something out there and that he can make it better. And so he goes out of his way and he wakes up and he realizes that, you know, there is a lot that has to be done. And it's sort of that the allegory of the cave, that thing. It's like, is ignorance better than understanding? And I constantly have to have that discussion with myself. It's like, I can either live my life the way it was going and be fine just for me, or I can inform myself because I have, you know, this cube in my pocket all the time that has tons of information at my fingertips. And I can use that to assuage my anxieties by also helping my friends and people I don't know. And that's what I love about the podcast is anyone can listen to it for free. um, Is that I can help share what I've learned and give that to other people. Um, so we've been researching, we were, we're doing an episode about what is fascism next season. And honestly, like it's really been scaring me. It, I'm hundred percent honest. Like I'm afraid. 
But the way to conquer that fear is to say, these are the warning signs of what it is. And this is what I can do to understand my place in it and my role. Um, one of my, um, a theater gig that I had worked two summers ago uh, was at this um, farm in New Hampshire. And this this beautiful old woman, Kathy, owned the farm and um, basically helped run the company. And she was actually a Holocaust survivor. And she told us um, this quote that I'll never forget. And she said, um, you know, 80% of people will not listen and 20% will. And the 80% is what you should be afraid of. Those people who don't listen and don't understand. And I've always kind of thought about that as like, I have to understand that some people won't listen and that's okay. Um, I don't know if that necessarily answered your question. I kind of went. No, 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 you can, you're doing just fine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that basically is what keeps me going and, um, is with, with my fears, the education is what will make them better. Um, because if I'm in the dark, then I'll never be able to be in the light. That's true. I, you know, I actually just had this conversation earlier about something in business where someone was talking about their employees and how like can't get, you know, compliance. And I was like, well, did you tell them exactly what, what it is that you expect? Right. And I think that that's exactly true with everything that's going on is let's clarify what these things are so that people can start to see like when you discount the media a great deal and everything that the media says suddenly becomes a lie, that is the start of fascism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's very concerning. Yeah. 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 That's the, yep. Yep. Oh man, hit the nail on the head. Now I'm depressed. Um, no, that's the thing too. I, I was actually just talking with um, my boyfriend about, with about COVID and about traveling. And I'm like, where is this line? It's like, I want to be safe, but I also want to enjoy life. But it's like, am I putting my life at risk by enjoying life? There's so many ups and downs and it's like, there's, there's a lot to question there, but the questioning one of my other favorite quotes is the journey is the reward. So yeah. it's the journey of understanding that will enlighten you. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's so good. Well, Claire, it has been about a half an hour. Mm -hmm. So you've had to talk to me for half an hour. You did a good job. Thank you. Thanks for you job. <laughs> listening for me to talk for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now we have to come up with a sketch. Before we get to the sketch, I really want you to check out Claire's podcast, Sit Still, Look Opinionated. It is so good. The link is in the show notes. So go down there, click them. I don't know if it's down. I don't know if it's up. Get in the show notes. Click on that link. One other thing I want to offer you is I have a completely free audiobook that you need no obligation other than just downloading it and listening to it. That's all I want you to do. And here's how I want you to do it. I want you to email the show at sketchcomedypodcastshow at gmail.com and say, give me an audiobook or whatever you want to say. I'll send you a link and I'll send you a code so you can get this thing for free. I am trying to do audiobooks for fun and money. So what I would love to do is get your feedback. Now, this book is a series of short stories. It's called Snapshots and it's fantastic. I didn't write it. Award-winning author Elliot Parker did, but I did record the audiobook and there were lots of accents and I would love to hear your feedback on how silly my accents sound. There's Irish, there's Scottish, there's a bunch, a lot of Southern, which is good. I can do Southern. I don't know why. But please hit me up if you want to get a free audiobook with zero obligation. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to do anything. You just have to click on a link and copy and paste the code I'm going to give you and free, boom, free audiobook for life. And you get to keep it and enjoy it. If you want to leave a review, fantastic. If you want to leave a bad review, uh, just email me the review and I'll make sure Audible gets it. And now, our sketch. Neo Way! With Claire Malky. In three, two. Morpheus, is that you? I've been looking for you everywhere. It is me, Neo. 
Come, get out of the goo. Here, wear a towel because you're very exposed right now. Oh, is this what it feels like? Not being in the Matrix? It is. You are in 2020. This is the world, not as we just merely see it. What? Well, what's different? Morpheus, this world looks so similar, though. I thought it would be, you know, aliens or computers or something, but... Yes, you came to in what we call an Ikea. This furniture is, definitely looks like it could be easy to be built. So, so what's this world like? Like, is it different than in the game? Here, we do not have universal health care. What? That's a main part of what our society. Everyone can be healthy. There's certain things that are happening now that maybe make it less safe. You know how in the Matrix, everyone is treated equally? Yeah, that's like a main principle. We don't have that here. Right now, there are a lot of protests because certain people are not given the freedoms that other people are. We're going to go fight them, right? Like, that's what we're here to do, like, for your mind, right? In a way. Quite honestly, the federal government is very much opposed. That's our First Amendment right to oppose the government. How are we going to do it? We're going to go make some signs and stand downtown and wait until the federal agents come into the area and shoot tear gas at us. Also, before we leave the Ikea, I need you to put this on. Over my nose and my mouth? Over both your nose and your mouth. You cannot breathe air near other people. Why do I have to wear this? There is currently a pandemic that is on its way to kill most of us. And this is the only way, the only way to stop transmission is to wear one of these masks. So just to reiterate, by wearing this piece of cloth over my nose and my mouth, at the same time, I can stop the spread of this deadly disease? Whoa. The only problem is most people refuse to do it. There's no way. It's so easy to do. We gotta go. We gotta go. We gotta go put these out. Unfortunately, everybody's supposed to stay six feet away from each other, so we can't hand them out. Well, can we take out a newspaper ad? Nobody believes anything they read in a newspaper or watch on TV unless it's telling them to do exactly opposite of what I just said. Is there any way I can, uh, go back, you know, in the goo? If you go back into the goo, you don't go back to your original world. What's it gonna be like? You'll live in a dystopian society where humans have been driven underground by robot octopuses. (sighs) You know, Morpheus, this is a really tough call, but, like, honestly, maybe that would be better. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's episode of Sketch Comedy Podcast Show. We hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed making it. Sketch Comedy Podcast Show is copyright 2020 Stuart Rice and is protected under a Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Looking forward to you joining us for next episode!